Good luck. Narrative Multiple police departments including the FBI, the Department of Alcohol and Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, and the Regional Stop Team cooperated to help track down the two suspects. The suspects really didn't have a chance, with all those departments working together. At 1.750 hours, the suspect's car was sighted by patrol officer Barbara Sanders. She immediately informed all on-duty patrol officers in the vicinity. Police mobilized. And when they tried to stop the suspect's vehicle, they fired repeatedly at police. And a high-speed chase began. The pursuit continued. As the suspects fired with AK-47 style rifles from the Chevrolet. Fourteen police cars and many homes along the robber's path were peppered with bullets. Police shot out their tires. But the shooting continued, fatally wounding the two suspects. When the vehicle's tires were shot, Officers exchanged gunfire with at least one of the assailants. The car finally was stopped near the Bommy Highway exit. And the pair was arrested with the assistance of riot guards, armed police and the anti-terror squad. The two wounded suspects were taken to the hospital with gunshot wounds. Jeremiah Ellis, 28 and Ashley Patterson, 24, both of East Chicago, were taken into custody. As suspects in the armed robbery of Amro Bank on 2720 South Madonna Avenue. They are being held in the central jail in Abidjan. Dialogue Good afternoon, sir. I'm here to submit the situation report. In the Amro Bank robbery case. Good afternoon, Officer Ramos. I hear you have already taken the suspects into custody. Yes, sir. Jeremiah Rellis, 28, and Ashley Patterson, 24, both of East Chicago, were taken into custody as suspects in the armed robbery of Amro Bank. On 2720 South Madonna Avenue. They are being held in the central jail in Abidjan. I also heard reports that the suspects opened fire on police to resist arrest. Is that true? Yes sir. When we tried to stop the suspect's vehicle, they fired repeatedly at police, and tried to escape. What happened next? A high-speed chase began, and the pursuit continued. As the suspects fired with AK-47-style rifles from the Chevrolet. Please continue. Police shot out their tires. And the car finally was stopped near the Bomi Highway exit where the pair was arrested. With the assistance of riot guards, armed police and the anti-terror squad. Were there any casualties? The two suspects were fatally wounded. They received treatment at the hospital for gunshot wounds. Was there any damage to property? Fourteen police cars and many homes were peppered with bullets. Thank you Officer Ramos. It was a job well executed. Thank you, sir and goodbye. Goodbye Officer Ramos.
narrative. When reaching the spot of the incident, the unpolled team noticed the presence of an armed Kamaz military vehicle belonging to the local military forces and personnel that were very nervous and exasperated. By interviewing the Sudanese military commanding officer at the scene, Captain Mohammed Bashir, the UNPOL team leader, learned that the gunfire originated when a Mercedes-Benz truck carrying several armed men, allegedly belonging to one of the militia groups operating in the area, appeared in the camp with clear hostile intentions. The truck didn't stop at the military checkpoint at the IDP camp and attempted to break in to the World Food Program, or WFP, warehouse. The Sudanese soldiers stationed just outside the IDP camp were alerted of the situation. They moved to the location and engaged in a fierce gun battle that lasted about 15 minutes, forcing the attackers to leave the place. No military personnel were injured during the attack. However, one of the WFP security guards sustained a bullet wound to the left shoulder. He was given first aid by military personnel and then evacuated to the medical clinic of the Médecins Sans Frontières, or MSF, at Area 51. According to the military personnel, the local security guard should be commended as he faced and confronted the attackers alone until the arrival of the military forces. He was seen being taken to the clinic and was doing fine. Someone informed that he is a former member of the military or a policeman. Not one of the attackers was apprehended, killed, and or left behind. However, the local military discovered some emergency bandages and traces of blood at the location where the attackers were engaging the military forces. The attackers were identified as members of one of the militia rebel groups operating in the area since a few months, known as Intihari, and the reasons for the attack were believed to be because of the recent delivery of fuel and medicine supplies to the WFP warehouse. The attackers are being pursued by a special operations platoon from the military with the support of a helicopter and personnel dispatched from Niala Regional HQ. They intend to chase, locate, and apprehend the perpetrators of this attack. The local military forces have not ruled out any possibility. However, they do not believe that the attackers may come back again to the IDP camp. The following is the dialogue between UNPOL team leader Ms. Halima Mwanga and the Army Commanding Officer Captain Mohammed Bashir of the Sudanese Military Detachment.
Dialogue. Ample officer. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. I am the Ample team leader of the Community Police Center, CPS, in Nyala, and would like to ask you the details of what just happened here. Captain Bashir. Good morning to you too. I am Captain Mohammed Bashir from the 103 Regiment of Northern Region and I am the commanding officer of the military detachment stationed outside the IDP Kalma camp. We were just outside the OCHA office at Aerial 51 when we heard the shooting. Can you tell us what happened exactly? Well, we were at the military camp when some of my soldiers noticed that a Mercedes-Benz truck carrying armed men was passing by the checkpoint and entered the camp without stopping, moving towards Area 51. My personnel realized then that it was an attack and we came in full force to protect the warehouse and to respond to this attack. Have you been able to identify the attackers or their intentions? We know that in the area there have been many rebel movements operating for several months. However, based on our gathered intelligence, we are quite sure that these attackers are part of the newly organized militia group known as Intihari that had been recently seen operating in the area. Do you know the reason or the motives for their attack against the WFP warehouse? We believe that most likely they realized that the warehouse received a large supply of fuel and medicine a few days ago. And I'm pretty sure that they launched the attack in order to steal these goods. Were there any casualties as a consequence of this attack? Unfortunately, the WFP local security guard was hit by a bullet on his left shoulder. Nothing serious, I believe. He was assisted immediately by our soldiers and then transferred to the Médecins Sans Frontières MSF clinic in the Area 51. There are no casualties among our forces. And what about the assailants? Was anybody injured? Were you able to capture any of them? Well, I'm not sure on the status of the attackers. You know very well they do not leave their own people behind, even if they are killed. So everyone was evacuated in the same truck they came in. We couldn't detain nor find anyone left behind. However, we found some traces of blood and first aid emergency bandages scattered all around the area from where they were fighting us. Do you know anything about the status of the local security agent that was on duty at the WFP warehouse? Well, that guy is a hero. He faced and confronted the attackers alone. Without his prompt reaction, I am sure that the perpetrators would have been able to gain access to the warehouse and take away all they wanted. I remember someone told me that he was a former member of the military or a policeman. Is there anyone following the attackers or trying to capture them? I have dispatched one of my lieutenants in charge of the Special Operations Platoon to follow the attackers. We are also expecting that a reinforced platoon will be dispatched from regional HQ to assist in this operation, even with the support of a helicopter. What about the security of the IDP camp? Do you believe that the IDP population might be targeted by this same group in the future? Uh, this is very difficult to predict. However, we are not ruling out any possibility. We know these groups do not attack the camps unless there is something attractive to them, like in this case the fuel and medicine. Anyhow, we are very close, although the police are working with us, so I don't believe they will come again. Captain Bashir, many thanks for your time and we are heading back to Area 51. Have a nice day. Enjoy the rest of the day and wishing you a safe journey back to Nyala village. Please inform the humanitarian officials they do not have to worry. We are here to protect the IDP camp. Many thanks for your reassurance. I will pass your message to them. Masalama. 
Masalı mı? Narrative. On 15 January 2010, Wednesday, at 23 hours, a jewelry shop was burgled in the city of Damas. An interview was conducted at the police station investigating office at 13 o'clock hours the following day on Thursday, 16th of January. The victim, Harry Octon, stated that he had to attend a birthday party of his accountant elder sister, the house located in Karima, North Sudanese market town. So he closed his shop earlier than usual around 18 hours. That night he enjoyed the party a lot and drank some packs of whiskey. The next morning he woke up late and had breakfast around 09:30 a.m. After having breakfast, he went to his shop as he reached there. He was shocked to find his shop broken into. He stood in front of the shop and yelled, Oh my God, my shop has been buggered. Somebody help me, please. After hearing his yelling, people gathered around him. Some made a call to the local police and a team of three police arrived at 10, 15 hours. The police had a look everywhere inside the shop and observed everything there. They found the safe and shelved open, which meant that the thieves had taken all the money and jewelries. According to the victim, there were 3,000 cash and gold and silver jewels worth $1.2 million missing. They had taken everything. However, Mr. Orton didn't lose hope and immediately informed to the police about the CC camera, which was concealed on the ceiling of the shop. Luckily, the thieves had turned on the light in the shop and the camera was able to capture some clips of the event. The police took the camera to the police station. With the help of the camera, they came to know that the time of the burglary was between 23.00 hours to 23.45 hours. They also knew two thieves were involved in burglary. One of them was recognized by the victim. He had visited his shop twice a week before. He had taken a look at some jewelries but had left without buying any. Mr. Otten didn't know his name or address, but he said that he could identify him if he saw him. Both robbers were around 26 years old, 170 centimeters tall, and wore t shirt and jeans. One of them had a cobra tattoo on his right arm, and he hobbled while walking like his left leg was shorter. So the police could easily track him. Two weeks passed. But the local police did not catch the thieves. Here is the dialogue between the UN police officer and Mr. Orton. Dialogue. Hello, good morning. I am Harry Orton, and I would like to report a burglary which occurred in my jewelry shop. Oh, good morning, Mr. Orton. When and where did it happen? It happened at 2300 hours on the 15th January 2010, Friday, at my shop located at 23 Mill Road, Delmas. What time had you closed your shop that day? I had closed my shop at 1800 hours, earlier than other days. Why had you closed your shop so early? That day I had to attend my friend's birthday party, so I left the shop earlier. Normally, what time do you open and close your shop? Usually I open my shop at 0900 hours in the morning and close it at 2000 hours at night. When did you come to know that your shop was robbed? I came to know about this the next morning at around 0900 a.m. when I came to open my shop as usual. Particularly, what did they take from the shop? They took $3,000 cash and all gold and silver jewelry. Okay, 
How much were the stolen goods worth? The robbed goods were worth approximately $1.5 million. Mr. Orton, had you managed any security system in your jewelry shop? Yes, there was a CC camera concealed on the ceiling of the shop. That's good. Did you call the police, and what time did they arrive? Not me. Someone called the police, and they arrived at 10.15. Was there any proof in the video? Yes. Police took that camera to the station. There was an important clip recorded in the camera. It showed that theft had taken place between 2300 hours to 2345 hours, and there were two thieves involved in burglary. I had seen one of them. He had visited my shop twice a week before. He had taken a look at some jewels, but had left without buying any. Good. Do you know his name and address? No, I don't know his name or address. What did they look like? They were both around 26 years old, 170 centimeters tall, in t-shirts and jeans. One of them had a cobra tattoo on his right arm, and he hobbled while walking, like his left leg was shorter, so police could easily mark him. Has the local police started their investigation in this case? I don't think so. They have kept the camera and the clips and just filed the case, but they have not started the investigation seriously. I visited them several times in the last two weeks, but they have neither arrested the culprits nor started the investigation. Okay, Mr. Orton, all your reports have been noted, and we will visit the local police and inquire about this case, and UNPOL will also start its own investigation. Thank you, officer. Narrative On 24 July 2012, at LNP Headquarter, Anti-Robbery Unit Office, made the separate interrogation to the suspects Eric Dye, alias Dog Farm, and Murla Thorle, alias Walking Stick, to gain information about the origin of M16 rifle recovered from them and their involvement in some robbery cases, particularly at Pencil Bill. Both suspect verbally added that they just stole the firearms to exchange it for food, but later they done armed robbery to stole money to buy foods to eat. According to Eric Dye, on 16th June 2012, at midnight along with his friend Korma Jolly went to the Jordanian camp Pence at Congo Town to beg for the food to eat. One mil Jordanian FPU official replied to them to wait for a while. While they were waiting for food, officer on duty left for the food leaving the rifle unattended behind his guard post. They opened the gate, rushed for the rifle, and started escaping with the M16 rifle. The first area where they went with the rifle to hide was away beach at Congo Town backed road. After the rifle was on their position, they operated armed robberies on three different areas in Montserrat County. They, together with AKA, also known as Walking Stick, made an armed robbery at Rehab Lone Star Tower in Jacob Town and they were able to rob assorted cell phones and share it. They again armed robbed Total Gas Station at New Hope Junction, Jacob Town, and they got $20,000 library in dollar. They also made an armed robbery at truck garage at Amagache Community and been able to loot assorted cell phones, assorted scars cars, and $200 US dollars. On 24 July 2012, they were arrested at Jamaica Road along with another rifle of similar mate. On 20th July 2012, Anpol officer together with LNP CST counterparts bringing along in handcuffs arrested suspect Korma Jale went to Jamaica Road for possible arrest of another suspect Sal John. 
who assisted to steal other M16 rifle from Jordan and FPU in 2010, but he couldn't be located. LNP CST counterpart tried to locate all the victims of the armed robbery perpetrated by the arrested suspects to record and file the same to the proper court and to strengthen evidence on hands to put the arrested suspects behind bars for good. Dialogue Police Officer Please state your name and age for the record. My name is Eric Dye. I'm also known as Dog Farm. I'm 22 years old. Do you know why you were arrested? Yes, I stole a rifle from Jordanian FPU a month ago. Why did you get involved with the incident? I, along with my friend, stole the rifle for the sake of food. What is your friend's name? Korma Jola. What did you do with the rifles? Initially, we stole the weapon for the sake of food. After the weapon was on our position, we operated armed robberies on three different areas in Montserrat County, Liberia. What weapons did you all use to rob the houses? Two rifles, hammer, and some iron bars. Who else participated in the robbery? Murla Torle, also known as Walking Stick, and other two boys. Do you know? Where the two boys come from? They are from Christian Community, Pennsylvania, Liberia. Why did you get another rifle of the same type? Well, it was with walking stick. It was on his position since two years. Do you have any idea how did he get this? In 2010, at a time that he couldn't remember about 200 hours to 300 hours, Torle had stolen similar rifle from the same place, Jordan and Yapu, and being used to conduct multiple armed robberies. What was your plan? We were making the plans to rob some more gas stations in Monrovia. However, we received information that the police were investigating the case and were searching for us with scare and content in a house. Thank you for your cooperation. We may require an interview with you again later. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Narrative On receiving the information from Mr. Peter Gonzalez, police mobilized a rescue party. The party consisted of two experts from the forensic team, two officers and five armed police from the operation team, and a doctor and two nurses from the medical team. At 1500 hours, on 12th of September. 2013, the rescue party headed towards the abandoned farmhouse, located at 49 Alexander Street, Lofa County. On arrival they quickly spotted the suspect's sedan, and the forensic team made a thorough search of it. They found a machete, cotton pads, and ropes which they impounded. The operation team surrounded the perimeter of the house, and the team leader gave the verbal command to whoever was in the house, to come out with their hands up. After five minutes, a slender build 1 meter 76 centimeters tall male with brown eyes, and dark hair came out with a teenage girl. The police quickly handcuffed the suspect and rescued the victim. The medical team checked the victim, and advised immediate transportation to the hospital. The victim was in a state of trauma, and bore signs of beating. She was bleeding profusely, most probably a result of brutal rape. The victim was transported to Elizabeth Memorial Hospital and the victim's mother was duly informed about her daughter being rescued.
The suspect was taken before the investigation judge, who ordered his detention at the police detention center. Dialogue Good afternoon, sir. I'm here to submit the situation report to the missing case, registered on the 7th of September, 2013. Good afternoon, Officer Ramos. What was the complaint about? At 1, 2, 3, 0 hours, the 7th of September, 2013, Rebecca's mother showed up at the Unpol station, stating that her daughter Rebecca had been abducted. What action did you take? Sir at 1, 4, 2, 5 hours, on the 12th of September, 2013, Mr. Peter Gonzalez visited our station and stated seeing the four-door, cream-colored suspect vehicle parked near an abandoned farmhouse located at 49 Alexander Street, Lofer County. What did you do then? We mobilized a rescue party. The party consisted of two experts from the forensic team, two officers and five armed police from the operation team, and a doctor and two nurses from the medical team. Could you make any progress? On arrival we quickly spotted the suspect's sedan, and the forensic team made a thorough search of it. They found a machete, cotton pads, and ropes which they impounded. Please continue. The operation team surrounded the perimeter of the house. And the team leader gave the verbal command to whoever was in the house. To come out with their hands up. What happened then? After five minutes. A slender build 1 meter 76 centimeters tall male with brown eyes and dark hair came out with a teenage girl. The police quickly handcuffed the suspect and rescued the victim. What was done with the victim? Sir after we rescued Rebecca, the medical team checked the victim and advised immediate transportation to the hospital. Was her condition critical? Sir the victim was in a state of trauma and bore signs of beating and was bleeding profusely, most probably a result of brutal rape. Where is the victim now? The victim was transported to Elizabeth Memorial Hospital. Did you inform the victim's family? Sir the victim's mother was duly informed about her daughter being rescued. What was done with the suspect? The suspect was taken before the investigation judge who ordered his detention at the police detention center. Thank you, Officer Ramos. It was a job well done. Thank you, sir and goodbye. Goodbye officer. Narrative At 1400 hours, 15th of April, 2011, investigators located a suspect in connection with the shooting at the Pines apartment. An interview was conducted at the police investigations office at 1430 hours the same day. The suspect, Joseph Bolt, stated that two days ago, on 13th of April 2011, 
at around 1,600 hours, he paid Raul Mocha 2,200 euros for a Fiat Punto produced in 1999. Joseph Bolt stated that the owner told him the car was in good condition. Joseph then continued to say that he had only had his driver's license for six months, and this was the first time he had ever purchased a car. He drove the Fiat Punto about 150 kilometers and found it had many mechanical problems. He had to stop about every 50 kilometers and put water in the radiator. And that, when he tried to come to a halt, the car did not stop well because the brakes were faulty. He needed to drive the vehicle to his family's home after work each day, which was about 100 kilometers. He also expected to use the vehicle for a longer trip of about 500 kilometers the next month. When Joseph realized how many mechanical problems the car had, he drove the vehicle back to Raul's apartment and asked for his money back. Raul appeared to have been drinking heavily. He refused to hand Joseph his money and told him he should have checked everything before he bought the car. They continued to argue, and the victim called Joseph a stupid idiot. Raul pushed Joseph and threatened to kill him. Joseph left and stole a gun from his father's closet. He returned to the apartment and shot the victim as soon as he opened the door. Joseph then kicked the victim in the head when he fell to the floor. He said he was angry because he spent all of his money on the car and it was not good. He then threw the gun in the river near Lakes Square. Prosecuting judge has authorized the suspect to be charged with homicide and held in the detention center. Dialogue. Police officer. I am conducting an interview in reference to the shooting at the Pines apartment building. Please state your name. Suspect. Joseph Bolt. Tell me what happened at the Pines apartment building on 14th April 2011. I bought a 1999 Fiat Punto for 2,200 euros from Raul Mocha on the previous day, 13th of April. I just got my driver's license and I had never bought a car before. I needed to drive 100 kilometers every day from home to work and back. Mocha said the car was in good condition and I believed him. I was desperate to get a car for work. Then what happened? I drove the vehicle for 150 kilometers. I found out I had to stop about every 50 kilometers to put water in the radiator because it was leaking. And whenever I tried to stop, the brakes didn't work well either. There were many other little mechanical problems too. I took the car to Raul and asked him for the money back. When was that? About 21, 30 hours on 14th of April. What happened when you asked for the money back? Raul had been drinking. He began to argue and said I was a stupid idiot because I didn't check the car before I bought it. He pushed me and told me he would kill me if I came back again. I went home and got a handgun. Where did you get the weapon? It belongs to my father, a 10 millimeter handgun that he keeps in his closet at home. Explain what happened next, please. I was just going to scare him and try to get my money back. But when he opened the door, I was so angry that all my money was spent and he wouldn't give it back, I shot him. I kicked him in the head when he fell to the floor, and then I ran away. What were you wearing at the time of the shooting? I had on a blue jacket and jeans. I also had a red cap in my pocket, and I used a ski mask over my face. I threw the cap and the ski mask in the trash behind the bus garage. Where is the gun now? I threw it in the river near Lake Square. Do you have anything to add? No, that's all. Thank you for your cooperation. This ends the interview.
narrative. Following the Peachinville homicide, Michael Madison, 35 years, was arrested on Saturday, 20th of July 2013, after three female bodies were found nearby the apartment block where he lived. Madison was located in his mother's home at the corner of E. 197th Street and St. Martin Boulevard, in Peachinville near the St. Soleil border. After a standoff with police he was finally taken into custody. In his interview, Madison stated that he worked in a nearby sausage factory until 2011. He left the job and became a member of an online dating agency where he publicized that he was a master looking for a submissive person to train. Soon, he began a relationship with Emmy Fordson, 31 years, but this ended after a short period, in 2011, when he found that she was not submissive. Women came into his life, but he was unable to bond with them. He felt scorned, and developed a strong feeling, of love or hatred against women, but continued to contact, more women in his role as a master. During this period, he read a book, called Nobody's Women, The Crimes, and Victims of Anthony Sowell, which detailed Sowell's murders, and the way he selected, his victims. Anthony Sowell, was infamously known, as the Peachinville Strangler, for multiple homicides, in 2011 in neighboring, Peachinville and after reading the book, Madison became influenced by his modus operandi of using women. He selected more submissive women, such as drug users, and those with criminal records, who would come to his home voluntarily. After taking drugs, and drinking Madison raped, his victims, and as a method of denial, he strangled them, until they choked to death. Once dead, he would wrap the dead bodies in a bin bag and throw them behind the apartment building, in a field. He also thought, that the nearby sausage plant, would hide the odor, of the decaying flesh. Madison's story of crime, was as predicted, by the police and justice officials. Madison identified, both the women, the one wearing, a leopard print purple leotard, was 25-year-old Michelle Mason and the other, who was wearing a green jacket, and had a pink orchid tattoo on her hip, was 31-year-old Imelda Hunter. They were both African-American women, with a criminal record, and a history of drug abuse. Both the women lived outside Peachinville. Following a court appearance, on 21st of July 2013, Madison was charged, with three counts each of murder, rape and holding people captive. However, Madison pleaded guilty, to charges of captivity. UNPOL officers, are trying to gather further information, to determine whether Madison, is associated with other unsolved cases, in the Peachinville, site Soleil. Dialogue Police officer, state your name and date of birth for our reference. Michael Madison. My name is Michael Madison. I was born on 4th of February 1978. Police officer, do you know the reason why you are here? Michael Madison, I know. I have been arrested for the series of homicides in Peachinville, the killing of three women within a 6 to 10 day. Period. Police officer, where do you live? Do you have any family members living with you? Michael Madison, I live at my mother's house, located at the corner of E. 197th Street and St. Martin Boulevard in Peachinville, near the site Soleil border. I live alone now. My mother is had not been around for the past three months. She has gone on a tour to USA. Police officer, 
Unpal, Carla Reese, why did not you surrender, when you were asked to? Michael Madison, I was afraid, since I am a registered sex offender, with the police. Before, I could find, a escape route, I was caught. Police officer, Unpal, Carla Reese, do you have a job? Michael Madison, well, I worked in a sausage factory, located near my apartment, until 2011, but I left that job, and became a member, of an online dating service, so now, I am a trainer, for submissive people. Police officer, Unpal, Carla Reese, are you in relationship with anyone? Michael Madison, no, not now. I had a relationship, with a lady named Emmy Fortson at 31 years old. But that did not last long, since was not submissive. We broke up in 2011. She was not the type of person, that I wanted. On many occasions, I felt scorned by women, and I started developing, a feeling of love, or hatred towards them. I just liked to use them and throw them. Police officer, Unpal, Carla Reese, what actually led you, to commit the series of homicides? Michael Madison, I had already started hating women. During this time, I read a book, Nobody's Women, The Crimes and Victims, of Anthony Sawell. The book detailed Sawell's murders, and his method of selection of women, and I became influenced by his modus operandi, and became his admirer. Although, Anthony Sowell, is infamously known, as the Pichonville, strangler for multiple homicides, I followed, his path. Police officer, Unpal, Carla Reese, how did you select the women, and make them subject to your hatred? Michael Madison, I chose woman, from the drug users and those with criminal records. They came to me, for doses of drugs voluntarily, or on my call. After taking drugs or drinking, I played with them, raped them, and in the event of denial, I strangled them, with a tie or belt, until they are choked to death. I then wrapped them, in plastic bag, and threw them, out of the window, in the bush behind the apartment building. The smell coming, from the sausage plant, helped to hide the odor. Police officer, Unpal, Carla Reese, can you identify the dead bodies? Michael Madison, yes, the first one, wearing the hoodie, and with the tattoo on her right thigh, is named Angela Deskins, a 32-year-old woman. The one wearing, a leopard print, Purple Leotard, is 25 year old, named Michelle Mason, and the other who had a green jacket, on and a pink orchid tattoo, on her waistline is a 31 year old, named Melda Hunter. All of them are black, African American women, and the latter have a criminal record, and a history of drug abuse. Both of them are from outside Pichonville. Police officer? Unpal, Carla Reese, you know that, you are a registered sex offender. You are now charged with three counts, each of murder, rape, and holding people captive. If you had been left, on the streets just one day longer, you could have put the lives, of other people in danger. You can face, the death penalty, or life in prison, if convicted of the charges of holding a person captive, rape and aggravated murder. Do you have anything to say? Michael Madison, I feel sorry, for the people for the crimes, I have committed. I tried to become a good man, but my fate wills me otherwise. I plead guilty, to charges of captivity. The women came to me, voluntarily and I am innocent. Besides that, I have nothing to say. Police officer, Unpal, Carla Reese, we are gathering information, to determine, if you can be linked, to other unsolved cases, in the Pichonville, site Salale. You could face, 
the death penalty, or life in prison, if convicted of the charges, of holding people captive, rape and aggravated murder. You will be sent, to the Pichonville, County Jail, today until the investigation is over. Narrative Following the death of Oscar Grant, community members and activists decried the shooting incident as yet another case of police brutality. There was broad public perception that LNP and the attorney's office were not conducting an effective investigation. Protests against SPU, LNP continued every day with scattered events, of stoning, vandalism and arson, and at times blocking motor vehicle traffic, at the intersection of 14th and Broadway. Some of the protesters, lay face down at the intersection, in a symbolic act of solidarity with Grant, who was killed in the same position. Others shouted at the police, and chanted in unison. Some carried signs, that read, Your idea of justice, and jail killer cops and lit candles in memory of Grant. In an interview with Unpol, Joseph Alba, said that Grant had a criminal background, and had served two state prison terms, for various felonies, including a conviction for drug dealing. In 2007, Bush Rhode Island police stunned him with a taser to subdue him after a traffic stop, during which Grant threw his loaded pistol into the air and ran. He was sentenced to 16 months in state prison, and at the time of the shooting, he was still on parole. On poll officer Josephine Gico saw video evidence that showed Grant did not raise his hands, above his head when instructed to surrender. It was also clear from the video, that Grant appeared, to be trying, to snatch Alba's weapon, from his hip, where he often kept it. While there have been previous cases, where police officers, have confused guns, with tasers, modern tasers, way half, as much as handguns. It was arguable, that the position of Alba's taser, in relation, to his duty weapon, combined with the different, feel and color of the two weapons, makes it highly unlikely, that he would have mistaken, one for the other. On poll officer, Josephine Gico, also interviewed several people, to investigate the incident. Grant's family, alleged in their civil claim, against Joseph, that he threw Grant, against a wall and kneed him in the face. However, the subsequent autopsy, showed that Grant's body had no injuries, other than that from the bullet wound. Alba, said that Grant, resisted the arrest and provoked him by trying to knee him, in the groin and by hitting Officer Perone's arm when he attempted to handcuff one of Grant's friends. The unpoll investigation concluded confirming that Joseph, 31, committed a crime inherently by shooting Grant. The actions indicated recklessness on Alba's part. On January 10, 2009, Monrovia, County prosecutors charged Joseph Alba with murder for the shooting. Alba resigned and pleaded not guilty. The trial began on February 10, 2010. Michael Raines, Joseph Alba's 
criminal defense attorney, argued that Albo mistakenly shot Grant with his pistol, intending to use his taser, when he saw Grant reaching for his waist seemingly to take out his sidearm. Pre-trial filings argued that his client did not commit first-degree murder and asked the judge to instruct the jury to limit its deliberations to either second-degree murder or acquittal. Dialogue On poll officer Josephine Gico. State your name and date of birth for our reference. Joseph Alba My name is Joseph Alba. I was born in 1982, and I am 31 years old now. Unpoll Officer Josephine Gico How long have you been with the SPULNP service? Joseph Alba I joined LNP in 2006. I was inducted from the Special Police Unit with the LNP and it's been more than three years now since I joined. On poll officer Josephine Gico. Do you know the reason why you are here? Joseph Alba. Yes, I know. I have been detained for the reckless killing of Mr. Oscar Grant, whom I had confrontation with on a fateful morning of January 1, 2009. Unpoll Officer Josephine Gico. Could you explain what happened? Joseph Alba. Well, on January 1, 2009, my station was informed of fighting on an incoming train from the Painesville, El Willow Station. The people were drunk and stoned. Apparently, they were coming to the train station, from Painesville after celebrating, New Year's Eve. Myself and my supervisor, Tony Piron, rushed to the scene, where up to 12 people, were involved in the fight. Piron lined, up Oscar Grant, and two other men against the wall, and confirmed with the train operator, that the men detained were involved in the fight. When I was about to arrest Oscar Grant, he resisted, and refused to be handcuffed. On poll officer Josephine Gico. Then, what happened? Joseph Alba. I warned him, to get back, unholstered my taser, and used it. But to my dismay, oh, my God. I shot from a .40 caliber, SIG Sauer, P226 into Grant's back, at 2.15 hours on January 1, 2009. Oscar Grant, 31, was fatally shot. He was immediately rushed, to JFK Hospital, in Monrovia, where he was pronounced dead, at 4.05 hours in the morning. On poll officer Josephine Gico. Did he say anything to you or to anybody else? Joseph Alba. He asked his friend to take care of his four year old daughter. With that wound, he knew that he was dying. On poll officer Josephine Gico. What was the wound? Joseph Alba. The bullet had entered. Grant's back, exited through his front side, and ricocheted off, the concrete platform, puncturing Grant's lung. On poll officer Josephine Gico. What happened then? How did the people react to the incident? Joseph Alba. The events were captured, on multiple digital video and cell phone cameras. The footage was disseminated to media outlets, and to various websites, where it was watched millions of times, and the subsequent days, saw both peaceful, and violent protests. The media highlighted, the incident and the community members, 
and activists decried the incident. People came in the streets, with placards and posters, reading Jail Killer Cop, and lit candles, in Grant's memory. Some of the protesters, lay face down, at the intersection, in a symbolic act of solidarity, with Grant, who was killed, in the same position. On poll officer Josephine Gico. Were the public protests peaceful? Joseph Alba. No, the protesters became violent, and caused over, $200,000 in damage, while breaking shop, and car windows, burning cars, setting trash bins on fire, and throwing bottles, at police officers. Public buildings, such as the Monrovia Police Internal Affairs Office, and the Paramount Theater, were heavily vandalized. Damage to the theater, was preliminarily, estimated at $10,000 to $15,000. On poll officer Josephine Gico. Did the police take action, against the violent protesters, vandalizing public, and private property? Joseph Alba. Police arrested, about 80 people for rioting, vandalism, assault on a police officer and arson and two of them were charged. Police recovered, two handguns, from the rioters. On poll officer Josephine Gico. What prompted, you to use your gun? Were you confused? Joseph Alba. Well, I intended to arrest, Oscar Grant, for public safety, as he has a criminal background. He resisted, by fighting and punching me. I used the taser, to calm him down, as he was not complying. During the quickly evolving situation, I was confused, between my handgun, and the taser, that I was carrying. On poll officer Josephine Gico. Do you have anything else to say? Joseph Alba. I have been accused, of committing a crime, of shooting by recklessness. I have resigned, and due to the increasing threat, seek refuse, in my friend's house. I shot, Grant, mistakenly, without intention, and I plead not guilty, to what happened. Narrative References made to the death of Elver Bimoli, reported on the 24th of September, 2011. On 28 September, Katrina Roku's mother reported to the police station. She stated that her daughter was involved in the crime, but was scared and refused to talk about the incident. Katrina's mother asked police for help. The investigation team accompanied Katrina's mother to her flat. Katrina looked scared, but finally agreed to reveal the details of the incident that she was involved with on the 21st of September. Katrina stated that Elver was planning to buy a car the next day and wanted his friends, Marco and Peter, to come with him. At midnight, all four of them left the club and went to Elver's flat, where they drank whiskey and listened to some music. Elver showed them a picture of the BMW vehicle he had, which he planned to buy for 9,000 euro. He took this photo out of a wooden box that also had money 
and jewelry in it. He gave Katrina a golden ring. They shared more drinks, and Elver became very drunk. He had trouble standing, slipped and fell to the floor, hitting his head on a corner of a metal table. Elver got cut and started bleeding, but he told everyone he was fine. He refused any assistance and asked to leave him alone. Peter grabbed the money and jewelry from the box and they went away. Katrina stated she wanted to call for help, but the brothers forced her to go with them. They argued in the parking lot, and Peter threatened to kill her if she did not get into the car. They got into a white Mercedes belonging to Marco. Peter gave Katrina the necklace and bracelet, but kept the cash with him. She was scared because Peter threatened to kill her if she talked to anybody about this incident. Katrina called Elver's house several times the next day and only got a busy signal. Katrina said she was expecting the two brothers to come to Allo Club at about 2200 hours tonight. The police operation was organized in the Allo Club. Marco and Peter came to the club at about 2230 hours and were arrested. The prosecutor was informed about the incident and initiated the formal investigation. Katrina was interviewed again the next day. Dialogue. Police officer, I am conducting an interview in reference to the death of Elver Bimoli at the Copper Street apartment building on 22nd September. Please state your name and address for the record. Suspect, Katrina Roku, 27 Park Road. Were you with Elver on the night of 21st September? Yes, Elver was at the Allo Club. He came in about 9 o'clock in the evening and had some drinks. He was waiting for two friends to come. Who were these friends? They were brothers, Marco and Peter Chess. Did they come to the club? Yes, they came in at about 10.30 and had some drinks with Elver. I finished my shift after 30 minutes and then joined them. So what happened after 2300 hours? Elver asked the brothers to go with him to buy a car the next morning and they agreed. Then he asked us all to come to his place to celebrate him getting a car. So we left around midnight and went to his flat. Where is his flat? It is in the Copper Street Apartments, but I don't remember the number. Tell me what happened at his flat. We listened to music and drank whiskey. First, we drank a partially full bottle, and then we finished a second bottle. Elver got drunk. He told us about his car and brought out a small wooden box. It had a picture of the car, a BMW. Then he opened a hidden drawer of the box and showed us his cash and jewelry. He said he had 9,000 euros to buy the car. How did Elver get the injury to his head? He wanted to dance with me. He was so happy that he gave me a golden ring from the box. But when he stood up, he was very unsteady on his feet. He fell and hit his head on the side of the metal table. Did someone push him down? No, not at all. He fell and hit his head, and then he sat on the floor bleeding. He did not want us to help him and told us to leave. When we tried to lift him by his arms, he refused our assistance. 
We got ready to leave when Peter grabbed the money and jewelry from the box, and we ran out to their car. I wanted to call the ambulance, but the brothers refused to do it, saying that we would be blamed for hurting Elver. I started to cry, and we argued about it, but Peter said if I didn't get into the car, he would kill me. What happened with the cash and jewelry? Peter kept the cash and gave me the bracelet and necklace. He said that if I spoke to the police, they would blame me and say I killed Elver to get the jewelry. I was scared, so I did not tell you the true story at the beginning. If you have told us the truth now, there is no reason to be scared. Peter and Marco were already arrested by us in the Alu nightclub, thanks to your information. We have already informed the prosecutor about the incident. We may need to interview you again later. Narrative At 0645 hours on Tuesday, 29th October 2011, police control spoke with a witness to the burglary of the IOM offices at Berisha Street, number 67, located in the north of town. Police patrol team from North Police Station, consisting of the driver, team leader, and two officers was dispatched to the scene. When the patrol team arrived at the scene at 0705 hours, the witness was standing in front of the building waiting for the police to arrive. He introduced himself as Alexander Brown, date of birth, 11th of June, 1970, residing at High Street, number 21. He advised the patrol team that he had called to report the burglary. He stated he had been next door to the IOM offices at a friend's apartment. He said he had been taking care of her house while she was on vacation and he had been watering her plants daily. Mr. Brown stated that he heard strange noises, and he looked out of the window to see what they were. He saw lights on in the offices, and since the IOM offices have never been opened before 0900 hours, no one should have been in the building at that time. He could see that one of the windows on the IOM building was broken, and the door was open. He could see the silhouettes of three people inside holding electronic equipment in their hands. There was a light-colored Opal Omega with an open trunk and parked near the building. The witness did not see the faces of the suspects but said they were dressed in blue jeans and white shirts. Later, on that same day, the airport police arrested the driver of Opal Omega who provided the names and the address of his two friends who were involved in the crime. At 0905 hours, the police team was dispatched to the house, number 75, located at the airport street, and arrested two suspects. The same day, the fingerprints were taken by the forensic experts from all suspects. The items found in the Opal Omega were also examined. It was revealed that the fingerprints taken from the suspects matched the ones taken from the scene in the IOM office. Mr. Brown was called to identify suspects. However, he was not able to recognize any of them as it was dark at the time of the incident. All electronic equipment found in the car was retained in the police station north until the completion of investigation. The prosecuting office ordered all three suspects to be retained at the detention center. Dialogue Station Commander Good morning, Madam. I have heard early in the morning your radio exchange with regard to the burglary of IOM facilities. Who was arrested with regard to that case? Team leader. A total of three suspects, sir. First of all, it was the driver of the Opel Omega 
who was detained by airport police. Secondly, it was his two friends who participated in the burglary with him. When was that? Two suspects were arrested at 0905 hours at the residence located at Airport Street number 75. Do we have any eyewitnesses of the burglary? Yes, Alexander Brown witnessed the crime. He was watering plants in the neighboring house at the time of the incident. The name sounds very familiar to me. Is he about 40 years old living at the high street near the church? Yes, he is living at High Street number 21. His date of birth is 11th June 1970. Was he able to recognize the suspects? No, as it was rather dark at the time of the incident. He stated from the very beginning that they were wearing blue jeans and light shirts, but that's it. Okay, clear enough. How do you know that the detained individuals may be linked to the burglary? Our forensics unit examined the items found in the Opel Omega. Fingerprints from all three suspects were found on the electronic items found in the vehicle. Additionally, fingerprints from all three suspects were matched to fingerprints found on the items placed on the table by the door at the IOM office. I assume all the stolen items are now at our station. We need to store them here until the completion of investigation. Yes, they were put in the evidence room, and the suspects will be kept in the detention center as per prosecuting office order. Thank you for your good work, madam. My pleasure, sir. Narrative on the 11th of April 2011, two suspects were arrested by a Comoro police patrol with call sign Alpha Mike 120 for the abduction of a young man on the 5th of April. They were brought to the police station in Comoro for further questioning. One of the suspects was Martino, who stated that he was born on the 20th, October 1989 and had gone to the capital city, Dili, on 4th of April, 2011, for a job after receiving a phone call from his cousin, Antonio Gomez, who is the owner of the microbus. Gomez stated that he had found a job for Martino. After arriving in Dili, Gomez took Martino to a small house where three students from Dili National University lived. Gomez introduced them and told Martino to stay with them that night. He then stated that he would come the next day to take him to his job. Martino noticed that all three students at the house took drugs and were involved in some criminal activities to earn money for drugs. Gomez came to the house the next afternoon and gave Martino 100 U.S. dollars and asked Martino to help kidnap another person in the evening. Gomez threatened Martino, and so Martino agreed. At 1900 hours on the 5th of April 2011, Gomez drove the micro bus with Martino and the three students to the Thai restaurant. One of the students carried a revolver, another student carried a machete, and the third student carried a hammer, while Martino took a bamboo stick in his hand. They stopped their microbus near the restaurant and waited outside. Five minutes later, one of the students called the victim on his mobile phone and asked him to come outside. As soon as Paolo came out, the suspects forcefully pushed him into the microbus and left. One student held a machete to the boy's neck to stop him from shouting. At about 2100 hours, they arrived at the house on Fomento Road, where the students from Dili National University lived. 
Martino admitted that in the house he hit the boy on his chest and wrist with the bamboo stick. Gomez left the house at about 2,200 hours, saying he would come the following morning and would make plans to get money from the victim's father. However, Martino stated that the following day they received information that the police were investigating the case and were searching for them. They locked the boy inside the storage room and fled. Dialogue Police officer, what's your name? Suspect, Martino. Tell me your date of birth. I was born on 20 October 1989. Do you know why you were arrested? I participated in the abduction of a boy. Why did you get involved in the incident? My cousin threatened me if I didn't join. What is your cousin's name? Antonio Gomes. Did he give you a reward for the abduction? He gave me 100 US dollars. Who else participated in the abduction? My cousin and three students. Do you know where the three students come from? They are from Delhi National University. Do you know why the students were involved with the crime? They were drug users and wanted to earn money for drugs. What weapons did you all use to kidnap the boy? One student carried a revolver, another carried a machete, and the third one carried a hammer. I only had a bamboo stick with me. What type of vehicle was used for the incident and who was driving? It was a white mini microbus and my cousin Gomes was driving the car. How did you get the boy to come out of the restaurant? One of the students requested Paula to come out by calling him on his mobile phone. What did you do in the microbus to stop Paulo from resisting and shouting? One student held a machete to the boy's neck to stop him from shouting. What did you do to the boy after arriving at the house? I hit Paula on his chest and wrist with a bamboo stick. What was your plan? Gums said he would come the following morning and would make plans to get money from the victim's father. However, the next day, we received information that the police were investigating the case and were searching for us. We were scared, so we locked Paula inside the storage room and left the place. Thank you for your cooperation. We may require an interview with you again later. Narrative References made to a case report dated 18th February 2012. Investigators arrived at the scene at 0500 hours to conduct an interview with the waitress, Anna Maria. She stated that Shaban owned the nightclub and that Issa came into the club at least four times a week. She stated Issa was the only customer in the bar that night. She said that Shaban and Issa ran an illegal drug business from the bar for a number of years. Isa would bring in money and orders to Shaban, who would then take the money over the border, buy the drugs, and bring them back to the nightclub. Shaban had a brother who worked at the border crossing, and he would cross whenever he knew his brother was working. Isa would later deliver the drugs to customers. However, business was failing in recent months, which led to the two men to often arguing. Around 0330 hours, 18th of February, 2012, Shaban and Isa were drinking together and they suddenly began arguing and shouting at each other. Shaban punched Isa. 
Isa doubled over in pain and could not breathe for a moment and leaned against the bar for support. Isa then grabbed a knife from the bar, threatening to stab Shaban if he didn't leave him alone. In reaction, Shaban drew his pistol from under his jacket and shot Isa. Shaban tried to phone his brother to see if he was working at the border that night, but got no answer. He then ran out of the back door of the club and got into a black Mercedes with registration Moonlight 1. Anna Maria gave police a photograph of Shaban standing beside his car. It clearly showed the license plate and Shaban. She said that when Shaban left the club, he was wearing a black leather jacket. The police transmitted the description and photographs of Shaban to all border crossings. Anna Maria believed that Shaban would try to leave the country if he could, and that he would probably try to go out of Border Gate Alpha 22, because it was the closest to the drug supplier's house where he would feel safe. Dialogue. Police officer, please state your name and age for the record. Witness, Anna Maria, 32. What is your occupation? I am a waitress at the nightclub Moonlight. I have worked there since 2001. Were you working at the nightclub on the morning of 18th February 2012? Yes, I was. Please tell us what you saw happen that night. It was very quiet at time. There were no other customers in the bar except for Isa. He comes into the bar at least four times a week. Why does he come into the bar that often? He had a drug business with Shaban, the bar owner. Isa would bring in drug orders and the money to pay for them. Shaban would take the money over the border and buy the drugs. Shaban's brother works at one of the border crossings, so Shaban would cross whenever he knew his brother was working. How long has this drug dealing been going on? They have been doing this for many years. The business has been dropping off and they began to argue recently about making money. They were arguing just before the shooting. What were Shaban and Issa doing just before the shooting? They were having drinks together. Everything seemed okay at first, and then I heard them begin to shout at each other. I didn't know what was being said, but they were loud. What happened after that? Then Shaban punched Isa in the stomach. It was so hard that Isa doubled over and could not breathe for a minute. He leaned on the bar for support. Suddenly he reached for a knife flying on the bar and turned to Shaban. Isa told him to leave him alone or he would stab him. Did he stab Shaban or try to stab him? No, he just held the knife and told Shaban to leave him alone. Then what happened? Shaban grabbed a gun from under his jacket and shot one time. Isa fell to the floor. Okay, what happened next? Shaban tried to call his brother who works at the border to see if he was there. He did not get an answer. Shaban ran to his car and drove away. Where do you think he would go? I'm sure he would drive to gate Alpha 22 because it is closest to his drug supplier's house and if he can cross the border, he will be safe. Do you know any information about Shaban's car? Yes. It is a black Mercedes with registration Moonlight 1. I have a picture of Shaban and his car. Do you want to have it? Yes, that would be very helpful. Can you tell us what he was wearing when he left the bar? Yes, he was wearing a black leather jacket. Okay, can you think of anything else to tell us? No, not at this time. Thank you. This will conclude our interview. If we need more information, we will contact you. Thank you. Narrative.
Following the phone calls made to Miss Red by the kidnappers, the police showed up at the nightclub called After Dark at 3 o'clock hours on May 9, 2011. They forced their way inside, freed Mr. Red and arrested the kidnappers. Following one week of captivity, Mr. Red was taken to the Martisant station by UNPOL officers for interrogation in order to shed light on the circumstances of his kidnapping. Mr. Red explained that, on Sunday May 1, 2011, he went to the clinic early in the morning to see a doctor and get examined for stomach pain. While he was inside the clinic waiting for his appointment, three Haitian men entered the clinic, looked at him with insistence, and immediately went back outside. He found it suspicious, but did not pay too much attention to it. After seeing the doctor, he walked out of the clinic and waited for a few minutes in front of the medical center for his sister to arrive. Suddenly, a brown minibus appeared in front of him and stopped. He was violently forced inside by the three men he had previously seen in the clinic. They were yelling and swearing at him. There were two other men sitting in the front of the vehicle, wearing masks and keeping quiet. Mr. Red was taken to the nightclub called After Dark, located in Jackman. After their arrival, Mr. Red was taken to the owner of the club, whom he knew very well. Mr. Red explained that he had previously been involved in some illegal business with the owner of the club. Following orders from him, Mr. Red smuggled goods from the Dominican Republic. Mr. Red was detained by police for about three months, and regained his freedom on April 30, 2011. He decided to stop any involvement in the illegal business. He now wanted to get back to an honest life and redeem himself. Mr. Red said that while in captivity, the owner of the nightclub threatened him, saying he wanted his money back. Mr. Red stated that he didn't know what money he was referring to and repeated he did not owe anyone any money. Mr. Red was locked up and handcuffed in the storage room of the club. He was bitten a number of times by the owner of the club during his detention. Dialogue Police officer, please state your name and date of birth for the record. Victim, my name is Charlie Red. I was born on 4th of February 1981. Police officer, first of all, we are very glad you got released after one week of being held hostage. Are you fine? Victim, I feel shocked after the police operation, but at least I'm not injured. Police officer, I realize that we made a lot of noise while breaking in. But now, could you explain me what happened on Sunday, May 1st, 2011? Victim, sure. I had been having stomach pain for about a week. So I made an appointment at the clinic to see a doctor about it that morning. Police officer, so you saw a doctor? Victim, yes. He gave me some medication to take. Police officer. So after you had your appointment you were kidnapped? Victim, yes. But I have to say that while I was waiting in the clinic, three Haitian men came in, looked at me with insistence, and immediately went back outside. I found it very suspicious, but I didn't pay much attention to them. Police officer, do you know these men? Victim. No, not at all. Police officer, 
Keep going please. What happened after that? Victim, after seeing the doctor, I walked out of the clinic and waited for my sister to arrive. After a few minutes, a brown minibus stopped in front of me. The three men that I had previously seen inside the clinic violently forced me inside, yelling and swearing at me. Police officer, there were only three men inside the vehicle? Victim, no. There were two other men sitting in the front, wearing masks and keeping quiet. Police officer, where did they take you? Victim, they took me to a nightclub I know very well. It's called After Dark and it's located in Jackmill. As soon as we arrived there, I was taken to the owner of the club, whom I also know very well. Police officer, do you have any idea why these men kidnapped you? Victim, well, I was previously involved in some illegal business with the owner of the nightclub. He used to give me orders to smuggle goods from the Dominican Republic. Police officer, we know that you were arrested by the Haitian National Police for smuggling meat and cigarettes about three months ago. When were you released? Victim. I was released on 30th April 2011. Police officer, so why did they kidnap you? Victim, the owner of the nightclub threatened me and said he wanted his money back. I have no idea what he was talking about, since I don't owe money to anyone. And while I was in the jail I decided to stop any illegal activity with him. I don't want to go to prison again. Police officer, we found you handcuffed at the storage room of the club. When did they put handcuffs on you? Victim, it happened the very first day, before they locked me up. The owner of the club came a number of times and bit me during my detention. Police officer, you will be taken to the doctor right now. Stay safe. Victim, thank you. Narrative. References made to the incident of vehicle damage regarding UN vehicle number UN 725, which occurred on Sunday, 14th October 2011. During further investigation of the case, it was revealed that on the night of Saturday, the 13th of October 2011, Officer Farrell spoke with the same local girl he had danced with the previous night, named Maria. Officer Farrell had been talking with her for the last two weekends. The two Greek males were both in their 20s and approximately 160 centimeters. One had a yellow stripe in his hair and the other had a green stripe. The Greek Cypriot male with the green stripe in his hair was identified on the surveillance cameras located near the scene of the crime as one of those who were looking closely at Officer Farrell at the Brickyard Bar. Sergeant Maher indicated that the man identified was the boyfriend of the local girl, Maria, who Officer Farrell had been dancing and conversing with for the past weeks. Police investigation revealed that the suspect identified by Officer Farrell was on a police wanted list. His name was David Papandreou, and he was charged with assault in September 2010. He was subsequently granted bail, but failed to report to police as agreed and ran away about a year ago. In that case, 
he severely beat his girlfriend named Vasilka Kostova, who was rushed to the Cyprus General Hospital where she had a miscarriage of a three-month pregnancy. It was further revealed that the relationship between Maria and her boyfriend, David, had worsened because David had constantly been beating Maria. However, David had continued to try to reconcile with Maria. He believed that her association with Officer Farrell would cause further damage to their relationship. David later admitted having damaged the tires of UN vehicle number 725. The Cypriot police charged him with assault of his girlfriend and causing damage to the UN vehicle. The SIPOL refused to release David on bail due to his previous escape and promised to prosecute him within 48 hours, as the Cyprus law stipulates. Meanwhile, Officer Farrell was directed by the UN Transport Section to report to the UN Security for his statement to be taken as required by the rule. Dialogue Ompo Commander Good morning, Officer Farrell. As a commander of your unit, I would appreciate if you could give me a brief update on the ongoing investigation about the incident involving damage to the UN vehicle number 725. Officer Farrell, I am prepared to give the update. What happened at the Brickyard Bar on the night of Saturday, 13th October 2011. I spoke with the same local girl I had danced with the previous night, whose name is Maria. In fact, I had been talking with her for the last two weekends. During the conversation with Maria, I noticed that the same two Greek males who were watching me the previous night at the bar were again looking at us closely from a distance. Can you describe those two males? They are both in their 20s and approximately 160 centimeters tall. One of them had a yellow stripe in his hair and the other had a green stripe. Anything else about them? Yeah. The one with the green stripe in his hair was later identified in the surveillance cameras which were located near the scene of crime. The FMPU officer, Sergeant Maher, indicated that the man who was identified in the camera was the boyfriend of Maria, named David Papandreou. This is the girl I have been dancing and conversing with for the past weeks. Was David arrested as a suspect? Yes, he was. In fact, further investigations revealed that he was on a police wanted list. David was reported to have severely beaten his former girlfriend named Vasilka Kostova and was charged with assault in September 2010. Was he prosecuted in 2010? No, Commander. He was granted bail after being charged with the offense but failed to report to police as agreed and ran away about a year ago. What happened to the girl who was severely beaten? Vasilka was rushed to Cyprus General Hospital, where she had miscarriage of a three months pregnancy. That was sad. Why was Maria conversing and dancing with you at the bar when she knew her boyfriend was around? Investigation also revealed that for the past three months, the relationship between Maria and her boyfriend had worsened due to constant beatings he had given Maria. He believed that her association with me would cause further damage to their relationship. What is the intended action of the police? Sai Paul has charged him with assault of his girlfriend and causing damage to the UN vehicle. However, he was refused bail due to his previous escape and the police promised to prosecute him within 48 hours, according to Cypriot laws. 
Is there any ongoing investigation by UN into the damage of the vehicle? I have just been directed by the UN Transport Section to report to the UN Security for my statement as required by the rules. Thank you, Mr. Farrell, for your time and the detailed briefing. It's my pleasure, madam. Narrative At 11.15 hours on 8 January 2012, the prison manager of Man Prison, Ms. Susan Doe, contacted UNPOL and requested them to visit the prison. Ms. Doe stated that one of the inmates, Mr. Jerry Smith, said he had important information concerning the attempted escape on 4 January 2012. UNPOL Patrol 2830 arrived at the prison at 1300 hours the same day and met with Mr. Smith, aged 67 years. He had been a prisoner in Man Prison since 2007, convicted of drug trafficking. Because of his age, Mr. Smith was respected by the other prisoners. In 2010, three new prisoners arrived in Man Prison. They were all members of a gang called Flying Lions. Mr. George Claude was their informal leader. These three prisoners had a bad influence on the other prisoners by using threats and physical violence. It was well known among all inmates that Mr. Claude was going to lead the Flying Lions and some other prisoners in an escape on 4 January 2012. Mr. Smith did not support this idea. Therefore, Mr. Smith was threatened by Flying Lions, saying they would hurt him and also get help from outside prison to hurt his family, if he said anything. Mr. Smith took these threats seriously, as all the weapons that were seized after the attempted escape, in total 17, were made by Mr. Claude. According to Mr. Claude, they were getting help from outside the prison by other members of Flying Lions to escape. He also said that one of the prison guards, whose name was not known to Mr. Smith, was helping them to pass messages in and out of prison. Mr. Smith described this guard as the tallest one among prison staff. This guard had been promised a share of the money from a bank robbery that Flying Lions planned after the escape. Now Mr. Smith was requesting Unpol to protect him and his family. As the prison escape failed, he could be blamed for it, and the Flying Lions could take it out on his family. Mr. Smith was going to be released on 15 February 2012. It would be devastating if anything would happen to him or his family at this point. Knowing the background of the Flying Lions, the Unpol Patrol understood how serious the situation was for Mr. Smith and his family. Therefore, they promised to follow up with local authorities and Unpol chain of command to ensure witness protection. Dialogue Police officer, I am conducting an interview in reference to the attempted escape from Man Prison at 1800 hours on 4th January 2012. Can you explain your role in this incident? Witness, my name is Jerry Smith and I have been an inmate in Man Prison since 2009. I was convicted of drug trafficking. Please. Go ahead and tell us what you know. Two years ago, three new prisoners arrived here. They were all members of a gang called Flying Lions. Mr. George Claude was their informal leader. Did their arrival have any impact on life in the prison? Oh, indeed. 
They had bad influence on the other inmates and took power by threats and even physical violence. Were you involved in any of their activities? No, but I knew that Mr. Claude was making a lot of weapons that he was hiding in different places in the prison. All 17 weapons that were seized after the attempted escape were done by him. Did you hear any rumors about the planning of this escape? Yes, I did. Some of the younger prisoners came to me seeking advices as they were going to take part in the escape. Some of them because they wanted to and some because they were forced to by the members of the gang. What advice did you give these inmates who came to you? I encouraged them to not take part in this plan. Was your advice known by the members of the Flying Lions? Yes, it was. The three members of Flying Lions approached me and threatened to hurt me and my family if I ratted. I felt no doubt that they were serious about these threats. They told me that they were going to get support from members of the Flying Lions outside prison and that they were going to rob a bank once they had escaped. How could they communicate with persons outside the prison? They talked about uh, one of the prison guards, whose name was never mentioned, but I know it is the tallest of all the guards in the prison. This guard had assisted them by passing messages in and out from prison. For that, he was promised a share in the money from the bank robbery. How do you feel about the situation now? I know what these guys are capable of. As the escape did not succeed, I think they might blame me for the failure. I will be released shortly, on 15th February, and it would be terrible if anything happened to me or my family at this stage. Therefore, I beg you to protect me and my family. As we know the brutal history of the Flying Lions, we can fully understand your worries. We will therefore offer you and your family witness protection. Is there anything else you would like to add? No, oh, I have told you everything I know. I'm very grateful for what you can offer me and my family. Narrative With reference to the fatal traffic accident in City Market on 2 April 2012, the Harbell City Central Police Station commander was briefed by the duty shift leader of the progress in the case. After the preliminary investigation at the scene at, in the market at 19.10 hours, the police went to the minibus owner's garage located at the address Ocean Street 24. Upon arrival, the police patrol found a man hiding in the garage. He initially refused to open the garage door, but police managed to break into it and arrested the man who appeared to be the minibus owner, Elvis Scale. Police patrol believed that the suspect was preparing his escape. As a result of a garage search, police found one unregistered Beretta pistol, one AK-47 submachine gun, and a box with mixed ammunition. Interrogation revealed that Elvis had stored the weapons since the wartime as he was one of the unit commanders. He wanted to keep it just in case because he did not believe that regular police would be able to maintain public order, and peace in the communities. He stated that he had left the keys of his minibus with the conductor earlier, but that he did not expect his conductor to take a drive. When Elvis learned of the accident, he believed the police might search for him, and so he decided to escape. He was not sure of the conductor's exact whereabouts, but he recalled a conversation they had had together in which the conductor talked about his cousin's two-story white building where he resided in Freedom Square. The police patrol proceeded to Freedom Square 
and demanded access into the two-story White House. When no response was received, they looked around the immediate area and saw a person running through the backyard. The police patrol chased and apprehended him. According to his documents and the description received earlier, the person was identified as John Masters, a 25-year-old minibus conductor suspected of committing the traffic accident which resulted in one fatality. Police could smell a strong odor of alcohol on him. Further tests revealed his blood alcohol content at the level of 0.15%. John Masters stated that one day before the incident, he had had a quarrel with his girlfriend residing near the market, who had blamed him for his inability to earn money and his inability to drive a car. The next day, when riding along with Elvis Scale, he decided to demonstrate his driving skills to her. By the time they arrived at the market, John had drunk almost a full glass of local rum from a flask he had with him. And when Elvis stepped out for dinner, John Masters admitted that he took the driver's seat and drove away. While moving toward the market exit, he lost control at one of the curves in the road and accidentally hit a man near the clothing shop. John then said he crashed into the wall of the shop. He got scared of the consequences and fled the scene immediately. Dialogue Station Commander Good morning, Sergeant. I would appreciate receiving the details of that traffic accident. Could you please brief me on the development of this case after the traffic accident scene investigation? Police Chief Leader. Absolutely, Commander. After the completion of investigation procedures in the marketplace, patrol team left for the address Ocean Street 24 mentioned by the witness. We found the garage doors locked, but we could see the light inside. Were you allowed in? No. We demanded entry, but the man inside refused to open the door. In the end, we forcibly broke in and apprehended him. How did the team identify him? We found his driving license, stating his name as Elvis Scale. In the market earlier, the restaurant owner stated that this was the name of the minibus owner. Why did he escape from the market? According to the initial statement taken in the garage, he didn't expect his conductor to go for a drive. When he learned of the accident, he realized that police might search for him, and he decided to escape. Did you find anything else in the garage? Yes. We searched the garage and found one unregistered Beretta pistol, one AK-47 submachine gun, and a box with mixed ammunition. Everything was taken, recorded, and dispatched to the station. How did he explain the origin of the weapon and ammunition? He said that he had been storing the weapon since the time of the war, as he was one of the unit commanders. He wanted to keep them just in case, because he didn't believe that regular police would be able to maintain public order and peace in the communities. Okay, what did you do after the dispatching him to the police custody? Before we did it, we asked Elvis if he knew the whereabouts of his conductor, and he assumed that John Masters could be at his cousin's house in Freedom Square. Are you talking about the big White House? Correct. The two-story White House. We arrived there just when John was trying to escape through the backyard. When we got him, he was obviously drunk. Further lab test revealed that the blood alcohol content at the level of 0.15%. Why did he drive the minibus? He said that the day before the accident, 
he had had a quarrel with his girlfriend, who had blamed him for his inability to earn money and even drive a car. And what did he do? The next day, when riding along with Elvis Scale, he decided to show his girlfriend that he could drive. When Elvis stepped out for dinner, John, who was already quite drunk after drinking almost a full glass of rum, drove away. While driving towards her house, which was near the market, he lost control at one of the road curves and hit a man near the clothing shop and crashed into the wall of the shop. He got scared of the consequences and fled the scene immediately. Okay, Sergeant. Thank you for doing a good job. Make sure that all documentation is prepared properly for further proceedings. Narrative Referring to the homicide case of Haitian male Raoul Cocotte, a 32-year-old male who died as a result of knife injuries inflicted by two unidentified men on 21 October 2010, the Haitian National Police Inspector Miranda Gaston, while visiting the victim's residence at 53 Dayton Street, took a statement from a neighbor, Jimmy Hodari, living on the floor above the victim's apartment. The neighbor knew the victim and his girlfriend. He stated that they had been living together for about a year and were going to get married. Raul was a practicing attorney, and they were very financially stable. However, for the last three months, the situation changed. Raul looked quite depressed and Jimmy could hear frequent quarrels between Raoul and Mia. One day, when Raoul was away for work, Mia was sitting outside the house and Jimmy joined her. In a conversation, he learned that they were facing serious financial problems, as Raoul had borrowed money from some criminals in the amount of $10,000 to rent a bigger apartment, and was not able to return it. They threatened to kill Raoul if he did not cover the debt. In addition, Raoul seemed to start taking narcotics, which made him depressed. Mia thought that those criminals had made Raoul drug addicted. They demanded that Raoul become a drug courier, and this would release him from his debt. Raoul disagreed, but he felt he did not have a choice. However, a couple of days before he was killed, Raoul said that he was expecting good money from a case he was dealing with and believed this would re resolve the problem. Regarding the day of the attack, Jimmy stated that approximately at 2,000 hours, he heard a noise and loud voices coming from the second floor directly under his apartment. He went out to the small stairway and saw the door to Raoul's apartment opened. He also noticed a black BMW vehicle standing near the apartment building entrance with the engine running. He managed to see one guy sitting in the driver's seat. According to Jimmy, the driver had a huge scar over his face and he was wearing black fingerless gloves. His face seemed familiar to Jimmy, who thought he might have seen him in the local bar called the Blue Lagoon where Jimmy played pool with his friends a couple of times. Jimmy also noticed that the right rear light of the vehicle was broken. There were no registration plates on the car. In about 15 minutes, he saw two guys running out of the second floor and rushing down the stairs. He got scared and moved back to his flat. After the whole group left, he heard a woman crying downstairs. Dialogue. Inspector Gaston. Good evening, sir. May I ask you several questions in regards to the incident which occurred in the apartment on the second floor? Jimmy Hodari. Of course. Do you know your neighbors living on the floor right under your apartment? Yes, of course. They are a young couple. The man's name is Raul Cocotte. 
and his girlfriend name is Mia Teto. How long have they lived together? As far as I remember, for about a year or so. They were going to get married. What can you say about them? Did you notice anything unusual in their lives recently? Raul is a practicing attorney, and they were well off. However, for the last three months, the situation had changed. Raul looked quite depressed, and he and Mia had frequent quarrels. Do you know the reason? One day, I chatted with Mia, and she told me that Raul had borrowed money from some criminals, in the amount of ten thousand dollars, to rent a bigger apartment, and it looked as if he was not able to return it. They threatened to kill Raul if he did not cover the debt. I see. In addition, Raul seemed to start taking narcotics, which made him depressed. Mia thought that those criminals had made Raúl drug addicted. They demanded that Raúl become their drug courier, guaranteeing him drugs and debt free. Raúl did not agree, but it seems he did not have a choice. However, a couple of days before he was killed, Raúl said that he was expecting good money from a case he was dealing with, and this would resolve the problem. What can you say of what happened in Raúl's apartment? At about twenty hundred hours, I heard a noise and loud voices coming from the second floor, right under my flat. I went out to the small stairway and saw the door to Raúl's apartment opened. What else did you notice? I also noticed a black BMW vehicle standing near the apartment house entrance. With a running engine. Was there anybody in the car? I could see one guy sitting in the driver's seat, and he had a huge scar over his face. He kept his hands on the steering wheel, and I could see he was wearing black fingerless gloves. I don't know him, but I believe I saw this guy a couple of times in a bar called the Blue Lagoon. Did you notice a registration plate of the vehicle? There were no registration plates on the car, but I could see that the right rear lamp of the vehicle was broken. Did you manage to see whom he was with? Unfortunately, not. When they left Raúl's apartment, I got scared and moved back into my apartment. A few seconds later, I only heard the sound of the car driving away, and soon after that. I heard Mia's crying. Thank you very much for this very useful information. We may contact you again for some additional details. No problem, Inspector. Narrative. Referring to the case of shooting at fifty-nine Stadium Street. On 14 March 2005, police patrol team Alpha Bravo One knocked on the door of the neighboring house. After approximately 10 minutes, an elderly woman, namely Gordana Basic, opened the door. She said that initially she did not want to open the door because she was afraid of the gunfire in the vicinity of her house. She stated that she lived alone, as her husband had been killed last year, and her son was in Austria with his family now. The police officers introduced themselves, and the woman invited them in. Gordana stated that approximately at 12:30 hours, when cooking lunch, she heard a car stop on the road between her and Bronko Ilich's house. She looked through the window curtains and saw a black car with three men in it. They were calling for the neighbor. Gordana saw all three of them clearly when they got out of the car. They all had a muscular build and were all in black uniforms with Black Panther emblems on their sleeves. Two were wearing black hats 
while the third one did not, but instead his gray hair was visible. One of the men wearing a hat had a distinctly strong accent while he spoke. Bronco replied that he did not want to talk to them and told them to go away. The visitors ordered him to come with them to repair their vehicles, otherwise they would kill him. A few minutes later, she heard two shots coming from Bronco's house. Those three men returned fire and she heard her neighbor, Bronco, screaming. When the gunfire ended, she stated that she saw those men placing Bronco into the trunk of their car. He seemed unconscious, and Gordana also noticed that he was wounded and that his right shoulder was bleeding. The car departed, and the witness was sure that they had driven towards the airport. Gordana thought that those perpetrators wanted Bronco to repair their vehicles because he was a good automobile mechanic, which he refused to do. The witness added that for the last three months, unknown armed people in uniforms had been looting the nearby houses and terrorizing the Serbian neighborhood. She also informed that her neighborhood was scared and felt insecure because they did not believe the local authorities, including the police, could protect them. She knew that some families had already fled the area and gone to Serbia seeking shelter with their relatives. The Alpha Bravo 1 team leader reported the received details to the duty officer at the police station and assured Gordana that UN and K-4 would be patrolling the area more frequently. Dialogue UN Police Patrol Team Leader Good afternoon, madam. Frankly speaking, we didn't expect anybody to open their door to us. We are the UN Police Patrol and came here because of the shooting we heard right near your house. Would you mind talking about it? Witness, I was scared. That's why I did not want to open up. But please, come in. We can talk. Thank you, madam. Could you tell me something about yourself? I am Gordana Basir. I am 60 years old. I was born here and I've been living here all my life. Do you live here alone? Yes. My husband was killed last year, and my son, with his wife and two kids, left five years ago. They are living in Austria now. Okay. What happened today? I was cooking lunch when I heard a car stop on the road between my house and Branco's. It was approximately 12.30 hours. Did you look outside? Of course I did. I took a look through the window curtains and saw a black car and three men in it calling out for Branko. I could see them when they got out of the car. So, what did they look like? All three of them had a muscular build and were in black uniforms with a black panther on their sleeves. Two were wearing black hats, while the third one was not. He had gray hair. One of the men wearing a hat was shouting to Branko in Serbian, but he had a distinctly strong accent. What caused the shooting? The visitors wanted Branko to go with them, but he didn't want to talk to them or join them. He told them to leave. They started threatening him, but Branko seemed to shoot at them twice. What do you think those people wanted from your neighbor? Branko is a good automobile mechanic. I guess they wanted him to repair their vehicles. Did the three men return fire? Yes, it looked that way. I heard five shots followed by Branko screaming. They stopped shooting, entered the house, and in a few minutes they were outside with Branko, who could hardly move. I also saw his right shoulder bleeding. Did the visitors take him with them? Yes, they opened the trunk of their car and dropped him in there. 
He seemed unconscious. Did you notice where they drove to? I am sure they drove toward the airport. It is the only good road here. Have you seen those uniformed people before? I'm not sure, but unknown armed people in uniforms have been looting in the nearby villages and terrorizing the Serbian neighborhood for the last three months. The neighborhood is scared and feels insecure because they don't believe the local authorities, including police, can protect them. I know that some families have already fled the area and gone to Serbia seeking shelter with their relatives. Thank you very much for your assistance. I will report the security situation in your area, and I'm sure that the presence of international forces will be increased here through a greater number of patrols. Thank you. Good luck. Narrative. Referring to the case, Mike Carl and his colleague got out of the building after a while, with one suspect handcuffed. He was all in black, with a scorpion tattoo on his right upper arm. Right after, Mrs. Donna Steve. A 35 years old female, a resident of Oscar Street at the opposite side of Max Beck's company mini stores, rushed to the two police officers. She introduced herself to them as a notifier of the case. She further stated that on Sunday, 25th of April 2010, at 10.00 hours, she noticed three suspects breaking into Max Pack's company main stores, and she called the police immediately. She further added, describing the other two suspects. One tall male, wearing grey t-shirt, blue jeans, and brown scarf. The other was quite short, shoulder-length hair, wearing black cap. While interviewing Mrs. Donna Steve, at the scene, a group of three men came towards the two police officers, leading a short guy holding a TV LCD. The two suspects were led by the two police officers, Mike and his colleague, to police station number 7. At 11.0, 15 hours, upon arrival, to the police station, Mike and his colleague met the two other team members, with the third suspect handcuffed. Dialogue Police Commander Good job, Mike. You and your team well done dealing with the matter. Mike Thanks, sir. Thanks to rapid response and the help of volunteers it was easier. Police Commander Tell me how was it? Mike Once I and my team member got out of the building after arresting one suspect, a 35 years old lady rushed to us. Police Commander Who was she? She called Donna Steve, a person who called the police on seeing the suspects breaking into Max Pack's company main stores. Police Commander What else? Mike She told us that she is a resident of Oscar Street at the opposite side of Max Pack's company main stores and she noticed the three suspects breaking into the ministers, police commander, and Mike, she gave us the description of the other two suspects. One of them was tall male, wearing grey t-shirt, blue jeans, and brown scarf. The other one was quite short, shoulder-length hair, wearing black cap. Police Commander, what about the description of the suspect you arrested? 
Mike, he was all in black with a scorpion tattoo on his right upper arm. Police commander, tell me when exactly did you arrived at the police station? Mike, we arrived at 11.15 hours and we met then the other team members after they arrested the tall suspect. Police commander, thank you very much, Mike. Mike, thank you, sir. Narrative 1 July 19, 2011 at 1,100 hours a suspect wanted for the murder of Goran Brown turned himself in at the Mountain City Police Department. Detectives conducted an interview of the suspect, who admitted to the killing of Mr. Brown at 2,115 hours on Thursday the 18th of July 2011. He stated his full name was Dan Green, and he was born March 15, 1991. At the time of the shooting, he was playing cards. There were five players, the suspect, the restaurant owner named Martin Small, the victim named Goran Brown and two other men, Frederick Popovic and Stefan Lyon. Dan told everyone he was playing with his rent money because he needed to try to win extra money to pay his rent and fix his car too. He said the muffler was so loud everyone could hear him every time he drove. Goran had a very lucky day and won a lot of money but Dan lost 900 euro, the amount of his rent. Goran and Dan became involved in an argument because Goran won so much money. Dan became angry, and accused Goran of being a cheat. Goran hit Dan several times with his fists. Suddenly Dan pulled out a pistol. He fired five shots and Goran fell. He said he only meant to scare Goran into giving him back his money, but then he shot him. He said he ran out and got in his car, a green-black Volvo which he had parked next to a house beside the restaurant. The muffler on his car made a loud noise as he started it up and he was afraid he would be stopped by police while he was driving, so he threw the gun outside the car window and drove away from the restaurant, heading toward North Street. The gun was a Smith & Wesson .38 Special Revolver, serial number SW9876, belonging to his father, David Green. He stated that he took the gun without his father's knowledge. Dialogue Police officer, please state your name and address. Suspect, my name is Dan Green, I live with my parents in Mountain City. Police officer, what is your age and date of birth? Suspect, I am 20 years old. I was born March 15, 1991. Police officer, what happened on July 18, 2011 at the Bird's Restaurant? Suspect, we were playing a game of cards in the back room. I was playing poker with the owner Martin Small, Goran, Stefan Lyon and Frederick Popovic, just the five of us. I told them I was playing with my rent money because I wanted to win enough to get my car fixed too. Everyone can hear me driving it because of the muffler. It is loud. Police officer, what happened next? Suspect, 
Goran was having a very lucky day and won a lot of money. 900 euros of that was my money, my rent amount. I got angry and accused him of cheating and he hit me, several times. Then I pulled a gun. I meant to scare him into giving me my money back but I shot him. Police officer, what else did you do? Suspect, after I shot Goran, I got scared, ran out and got in my car. It had a loud noise from the muffler like it always does when I started it. I had hoped to win enough money for repairs. Police officer, what did you do with the gun? Suspect, I threw it out of the window. I was afraid police would stop me while I was driving and find it. Police officer, where were you at when you threw it out? Suspect, next to the house beside the restaurant, where I parked my car. Police officer, how many shots did you fire? Suspect, five, I think. Police officer, what kind of car did you drive that night? Suspect, a 1989 Volvo, green and black. Police officer, what kind of weapon did you use to shoot Goran? Suspect, a Smith & Wesson point three eight Special. It belonged to my father. Police officer, what were you wearing at the time of the shooting? Suspect. Blue jeans and a blue pullover. Police officer, where did you go when you left the restaurant? Suspect. I headed toward North Street and then went straight to my home. I took it without his knowledge. I knew the gun could be traced to my father and I did not want him to get in trouble so I turned myself in. Police officer, do you have anything else to say? Suspect, no, not at this time. Police officer, this concludes the interview. Thank you for your cooperation. Second part of CLA Narrative Referring to the case On Wednesday, 12 February 2012 At about 08.45 hours Mr. Ralph Kim, 62 years old The father of Mrs. Susan Called her to ask her about her sister Martha Who didn't come back home yet Mr. Ralph tried to call several times, but without response from Mrs. Sozen's side. The man got worried and decided to go to his daughter Sozen's house to find out what was exactly going on. At about 0900 hours, Mr. Ralph headed to his daughter residence at 4 Adagio Street. Upon arrival, and five minutes later, he got astonished when he found the house front door opened. Mr. Ralph entered amazingly and there was no recipient. He proceeded to the living room where he found on the table a bottle of whiskey and two cups, one marked with lipstick. He found also a red blouse on the sofa and a pair of female pink shoes on the floor. Then he headed to the kitchen but he didn't find anybody there as well. Getting into the bedroom, Mr. Ralph found his daughter Susan lying faint on the floor. He tried to help her retrieving her consciousness. Minutes later, Mrs. Susan came back to consciousness. 
She was in a very traumatic condition, crying all the time without telling anything. Trying to know about what happened to her, at about 09.30 hours, Mr. Ralph called her husband Eric. Eric answered him regretting, telling him what happened that night. Mrs. Susan decided to make a complaint at the police station. The father tried hard to change her mind and to treat the issue domestically to avoid scandal. The lady insisted to sue her husband and sister. She headed to police station number 8 by her Alfa Romeo car, license number LG5361. Mr. Ralph followed her by a taxi. Major Scott, the station police commander, met the lady and interviewed her listening to her complaint. Afterwards, he interviewed Mr. Ralph as a witness. Dialogue Major Scott Good morning, sir. May you introduce yourself? Mr. Ralph My name is Ralph Kinn. 62 years old, and I'm the father of Mrs. Susan. Major Scott, do you have any more over what she said? Mr. Ralph, I know it's very sensitive and domestic, but Susan insisted to inform the police. At about 08.45 hours this morning, I called Susan to ask her about her sister Marta, as she didn't get back home since yesterday's evening. Major Scott, what happened afterwards? Mr. Ralph, I decided to go to her house as she was only 5 kilometers away from my residence. Major Scott, what did you find there? Mr. Ralph, I got amazed when I found the front door of the house opened and nobody in. I first headed to the living room where I found a bottle of whiskey on the table and two cups, one of them had lipstick marks. I found also a red blouse on the sofa and a pair of pink female shoes on the floor. Major Scott, then what happened? Mr. Ralph. After that, I entered the kitchen, but there was nobody as well. I, fin I finally got in the bedroom where I found my daughter Susan lying unconscious on the floor. I tried to awake her and she restored consciousness minutes later. Major Scott, was she the one who told you what happened? Mr. Ralph. No, she was in a very traumatic condition, so at about 09.30 hours, I called her husband Eric to know what happened, and he told me the whole story. Major Scott, why didn't you try to tackle the matter domestically? Mr. Ralph, definitely I tried to do that, but Susan insisted to raise the issue. She headed to the police station number 8, by her Alfa Romeo car license number LG5361 and I followed her by a taxi. Major Scott Thank you, Mr. Ralph. Mr. Ralph Thank you, Major. Narrative on Sunday, 23rd March, 2008, at 1330 hours, a man called Joseph Alba entered police station number seven and said that a group of stray dogs had attacked his son, John. The son had been taken to the hospital for treatment and the police officers shot the dogs later that day. On Monday, the 24th of March, 2008, at 1300 hours, 
about 50 people assembled outside the main police headquarters protesting against the situation in the city regarding stray dogs. Miss Elizabeth Johnson, a primary school teacher, was the leader of the demonstration. She had witnessed the incident with the boy and the dogs and was called in for a statement. She came to the Monrovia Police Station number two on Tuesday, the 25th of March, 2008, at 10 hundred hours to give her witness statement. She confirmed that she was the founder and the leader of the organization People Against Dogs, or PAD, which was responsible for the demonstration the day before. The organization was established in 2006 to fight against the stray dog situation in the city, which has been threatening the safety of its inhabitants. Ms. Johnson was also concerned about the dog's welfare and questioned why the police consistently responded to these incidents by killing them. She was of the opinion that the police had more important things to do and that the problem with the aggressive dogs was more of a community responsibility. Lack of trash services, as well as the absence of dog shelters and poor veterinary services were the main reasons for problems with the stray dogs. Her organization delivered three petitions to the office of the city mayor on the issue in the past. Ms. Johnson further stated that she had witnessed the situation with John Alba and the dogs on Sunday. All three dogs had been dirty and in a generally poor state. It seemed to her that the dogs thought the boy had brought them food in the plastic bag he was carrying. When they understood that he did not bring them anything, they attacked the boy and seriously bit him in the face and on his body. She noticed that the ambulance came and took the boy to the hospital. She learned later that the police killed the three dogs without trying to catch them and bring them to the veterinarian. She clearly stated that the police should be more observant towards the local people and how they treated the dogs in the city and cooperate with the community to find better solutions. Dialogue. Police officer, please state your name. Witness. My name is Elizabeth Johnson. What is your profession? I am a school teacher at Monrovia Primary School. On Sunday, 23rd March, you witnessed a dog attack on a local boy. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Can you please describe what you saw? I was out walking to get some fresh air. I was on Low Street when I saw a little boy coming out from his house with a red ball in his hands and a plastic bag. What happened then? Three dirty stray dogs approached him, most likely to get food. The boy did not have any food for the dogs, so the dogs approached him and attacked him. Was the boy injured? Yes. To my knowledge, he was bitten on his face and arms. I saw an ambulance taking him away from the scene. Yesterday, you also attended a demonstration outside the main police headquarters related to the case. Tell me the reason behind this demonstration. I am the leader of the People Against Dogs, or PAD, which is an association founded in 2006. I've experienced an increasing problem in Monrovia of stray dogs threatening the citizens. 
and so I established this organization. Do you know why Monrovia has these issues? I believe there are three main reasons for that. It is the lack of trash services, the absence of dog shelters, and poor veterinary services. Have you witnessed similar situations in the past? This happens almost every day, and in my opinion, the police have better things to do other than responding to situations like this. Was that the reason for the demonstration as well? Yes. We want to emphasize that it is community responsibility to improve the situation and to prevent further dog attacks on our citizens. We have already submitted three petitions to the Office of City Mayor with no result. Thank you for your assistance. We will take up this matter seriously and follow up with the mayor's office from our side.